Thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to Life, Death, Comics, and Everything in Between panel, uh, where we're going to talk about some memoir <coughs> comics that, uh, I mean, there are memoir comics and there are memoir comics. I think all three of our panelists today have incredibly dramatic stories, unexpected stories, um, very unusual stories, and that they've put in comics form with uh, so much craft and passion. Um, so we're going to talk about that and some of their other work and how they approach it. So uh, let's see. We have, I'll start from the, the left, and we have Durf, Beck Durf, the award-winning cartoonist behind My Friend Dahmer and his new book, Trashed. Um, next to him, we have Jennifer Hayden, whose new book, The Story of My Tits, a book that title that will get many problems. But <laughs> and then we have uh, Frederick Peters, the author of Blue Pills, but also um, the AMA series, uh, Pachyderm, and Sandcastle. So please welcome our panelists. Um, so I'm gonna, I have some images, just so we can kind of familiarize everyone who isn't, doesn't know your work. Um, so Jennifer, I have you up for first here. Um, and you have always, your comics work has always been autobiographical, correct? Yep. Okay, and like, so your first book was Underwire, which is also published by Top Shop, which also perhaps a um, breast-oriented <laughs> title or not? <laughs> It sounded that way, and everybody was very confused. They thought it was the story of my tits because it was Underwire, and that's understandable. And I promised never to publish another book with a title referring to breasts. <laughs> <laughs> never again. Yeah. This has, underwire had nothing to do with boobs, really. <laughs> okay. All right. So it's not, you know, the next one isn't going to be whalebone or, you know, <laughs> corset. Yeah. <laughs> Made of form. Cleavage. Um, so, um... So the story of what is the story of your tits, and why did you decide you were you were a illustrator before? So why did you decide to do this comic to tell the story of your your boobies, <laughs> moms? Yes, the girls. Lead with the ladies, as my friend always says. Um, okay, I came to comics very late. I was, um, I mean, I read comics when I was little and I drew all the time and then I went off to college and decided I needed to become Ernest Hemingway. So I wrote and wrote and wrote. And I didn't do any more art, <coughs> although I majored in art history, so I was studying art. Um, and then I wrote uh, about three just awful novels when I got out of college, just wretched, never published. And then when my kids were born, I have two of them uh, now in college, um, I decided I missed drawing, so I went back to drawing. And all I wanted to do was just draw with a rapidograph, and I was happy with that. So when I started doing that, it. I decided to do children's book illustration. It seemed like the natural thing. Um, but actually, what was funny was they wanted me to do stuff in color, and I didn't like to paint. And I thought, oh, god, this isn't going to work. So I did that for a few years, and then I was diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, which sucked. And I had a bilateral mastectomy with reconstruction. And um, when I was recuperating, I wanted to read, you know, books. I'd had this large surgery, and I needed to hang out and get well. And um, so I, I, I saw a, an article in the New York Times, believe it or not. I mean, they're always behind the times, but they had um, a roundup of graphic novels, which I really had never looked into. So I, I picked up Joy Desai and Jeffrey Brown and... Uh, Marjane Satrapi and Linda Barry, and I just read and read and read for like a year straight, everything I could get my hands on, everything I thought was really excellent. And then um, at the end of that, I made myself start drawing this book. I knew I wanted to tell the story as soon as I'd been through the experience, but I realized reading graphic novels that they were the way to do it, that there was no more expressive medium I could imagine. Um, and it combined my writing with drawing. I could do both things that I loved. But you, you, but you started doing a diary comic. Like you've been doing diary comics for quite a while, right? Though I mean, concurrently, or because I, I had this, um, like this is one just from January where you're actually talking about the book. You know, so this is running on your website, right? Well, the it's it is confusing. I'm pretty ADD. So what happens? This I start this book, and the first pages in here are the first things I ever drew. The first first panels I ever drew are the first panels in this book, which took eight years to complete. Now I got a little bored along the way, and also this stuff was pretty heavy. So I took breaks, and uh, what I did was early on Dean Haspiel, um 
a wonderful New York cartoonist and, and person who just helps cartoonists come into being. Um, he kind of mentored me and invited me to contribute a comic to his website, Activate, in, out of Brooklyn. I created Underwire for that site. I was already working on this book. Underwire ran for two, two years monthly, and that was my present life. That was stories about my children and, um, you know, uh, a thing post breast cancer. Um, then when uh, I realized I was wasting too much time on that, I begged Top Shelf to publish it and get me out of my own trap, and then I, I stopped doing Underwire. I went back to this, then I, get bored, I got bored again, and then I started Scrapbook, which was another comic I ran. I didn't do as many of those, but it's a very short form for a panel thing. It's been on various websites, as apostrophe crap book. And then um, I, uh, when I, I was getting close, I was within a couple of years of finishing this, I, I realized it was kind of interesting, might be interesting to document the process of finishing it, and it would ex it would give me ex the excuses. I'd be able to show how distracted I had been from the book, you know, by everything that was happening around me. We had to move, we had to, you know, our dog had to be put to sleep, we had to get a kid into college, like all this crap happens and you're trying to do something. That's what rushes, that's <laughs> the inspiration for rushes. And that ran, has run for three and a half years, and I hope to collect that at some point. But um, yeah, but that's that's done now because this book coming out was the culmination for, for Russia's. Yeah. Right. Um, well, we'll talk more about the actual making of it and what went into it. So let me talk, uh, Durf. So you have, hello. hello. You have a long history of um, inspired by like your real life experiences. Mm -hmm. So this was like your kind of inspired by maybe <coughs> punk rock experience. Oh, that was my first book. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So, but it was it wasn't nonfiction. No, I didn't do I didn't do memoir uh, to start with because uh, well for a couple reasons. But really, one of the main reasons was when I I I grew up in uh, I, I'm based in Cleveland, and in fact I live in the same neighborhood as as Harvey Picard did. We used to shop at the same grocery store. So he never had much use for me. I could only get a grunt out of him when I saw him in the aisle. I think most people only get a grunt out of Harvey. So when I started doing in doing long form comics, and I spent 30 years doing a comic strip in those weekly rags you used to trip over whenever you walked into coffee shops. And when I moved to long form comics, um, I knew that I just wanted to not be the poor man's Harvey Picar because of you know the prose proximity. So uh, I went a different way, and I decided just to try fiction. But I, I always write fiction like this one based on experience, just because I think it gives your work a little more detail. Right. Um, well, of course, you had, um, you know, your worldwide sensation, my friend Dahmer, and um, you know, this was a long time coming. You did it in various forms. Right. And you had done a, a shorter comic that was like a mini comic, or a yeah, I did. I did a couple versions. Yeah, I right. did. Uh, I first wrote. I first did some short stories. One popped up, I think, in zero zero, which was an old Fantagraphics anthology. Um, and then I pitched a, uh, a hundred page graphic novel. I wrote a hundred page graphic novel. So it's probably nineteen ninety eight, maybe ninety seven which is very different than the final book, but um, it's what I had at the time. And Fantagraphics turned that down, as did most comics publishers, to which I now say. <laughs> um, <coughs> and so I published a, a floppy, I self-published a floppy in, uh, I think it was 2002, just, just to show them, hey, this is what it is. Because the moment you heard the words, my friend Dahmer, you know, you think, ugh. Heads yeah. in the refrigerator, necrophilia, no thanks. <laughs> Though they'll publish, you know, zombie prostitutes from hell without a blinking an eye, they won't. They wouldn't okay. go after with a, a torture variant cover. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so I put that out in the hopes of attracting a larger publisher, and, and failed completely in that <laughs> test. But that little floppy got nominated for an Eisner, <laughs> so which didn't do me any good either. So I mean, it was just this long road, and then finally. Like, uh, man, almost 10 years later, I finally landed it at Abrams, and yeah. they put it out. So, um, 
uh, you your new book. I'm gonna come back again. I'm gonna come back to that. Now your new book is it's more of like a, maybe a hybrid between memoir and possibly of, yes. Yeah. Yes. How would you describe Trashed? Uh, it's it's a, sort of a raucous uh, Rust Belt epic about garbage men and this secret world of garbage collection. It's this rollicking comedy. And I was a garbage man. Actually, right after I was friends with Jeffrey Dahmer, I was a garbage man. And also a punk rocker. So, I mean, there was a, <laughs> there was a, a creative writing prof of mine who said, you've experienced everything you need in life by the time you're 20 to be a writer. And my first three books all happened before I was 20, so the <laughs> fucker was right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, who knows if you'd, you know, gone to become an astronaut or something, you'd have completely different books. Right, but this is fiction. It started out as memoir, and then early on, and, I, and then I did a webcomic later where I brought it up to the present day and, and started fictionalizing it, just because it gives you more freedom. And I know that's kind of blasphemy in a memoir panel, but um, I like writing fiction because you can just wander wherever you want to. Yeah. And I know there are some memoir creators who will also do that, but um, you shouldn't. Um, I just I just like that uh, that freedom just to wander where the story w wants to go. Right. Um, now, Frederick, you um, you did Blue Pills. I know that this was your first sustained work, correct? Yeah. And this started also as a diary, or um, no? It's a bit different. It's, it was, in fact, it was not supposed to be a book. Um, it was supposed to be a personal experiment. Uh, it was made in 2000, and um, at that time it was the, the end of a kind of new wave movement in, in France, launched by the L'Association Publishing sure. House. And basically it was based on what happened in the States in the 70s <laughs> with the, yeah, Robert Crumb and etc. But also different things. In, fr in France, the industry is very, you know, it's stuck. There are a lot of rules and formats and everything. So L'Association and, and people around it, they decided to change everything, change the rules, to, uh, draw in black and white, draw badly, <laughs> which mm -hmm. was not allowed in France before, uh, because the story is what is the most important and things like that. So uh, it's not my first real book. I had a, a, a book called Les, Les Miettes before. Anyway, it's not published in, in English because nobody can tr translate it. <laughs> the, the French is really weird. And um, it was an exhausting book to make, uh, full of trains, horses, uh, difficult things to draw. And I wanted to wash myself and try something else. So, uh, I, yeah, I decided to try something without penciling, without writing. It's like really pure improvisation. And it was easier for me to take an intimate subject. Because if you want to make a pure improvisation on nuclear physics <laughs> or <laughs> whatever, you, you mean... You need a lot of documentation and readings, and so, so that was much more easy. Right. And I, I did like 35 pages for, for myself to see how it works. Like a, it was like a photocopy machine, you know? I had a pile of A4 um, cheap paper, and I was drawing like this, <laughs> and drawing like this. And it's also because, because of that, the first pages that you don't have here are totally abstract because it was a way of um, start the engine. It was like drawing on the phone, you know, and let let those things happen, see w what's going to happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. and those thirty-five first pages, I showed them to Daniel, my friend, um, and we at that time we were creating a publishing house, and he said, uh, "Okay." It's great. Let, let's make 500 pages if you want. We make a book out of it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm not sure it was a very good idea, but, <laughs> but <laughs> it turned to be a good idea. Yeah, this is, um, and I mean, the story is about how you meet a woman who... Yeah, it's about my life. Yeah, yeah your life, where you fall yeah. in love with this woman, and then one day she tells you yeah. that she is HIV positive, yeah. and 
you know, how you move forward from that. So it's very personal. Yeah, yeah, and, it is. And but and the fact is, it was not supposed to be read by people. <laughs> 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 See? So that's why it is so uh, sincere and, mm. yeah, vi uh, violent in a way. Okay. And, and I, I have some other slides of your work after this, and since then you haven't done anything that's memoir, right? No, no, no. Because <laughs> it's like space fact, fantasy. I, d I don't like this very much. Uh -huh. I don't like to read it very much. Uh, Two of the three people up here don't really do memoir comics. You <laughs> can all leave now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Well, I think, you know, so the question, and I mean, I have done other panels with memoirists, and of course the question is always, that everybody wants to know, is how do you decide what to put in and what to leave out? Huh. Well, <laughs> um, in my case, the, you know, the story was, was written for me, so, I mean, I just, I think you have to approach memoir, you have to approach memoir with just, you know, this kind of this blind courage. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't be afraid to portray yourself as an asshole, and that really is what it comes down to. I mean, and, and you just have to service the story. You know, the story is what counts. And if you're an asshole at certain points in the story, then that's the way it has to be. And, and I think readers can tell when something is uh, is true, and when something has that you know that kind of honesty. And uh, all the good memoir that I've read, I mean, that's you know that's that's been evident. Um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of taste involved in autobiography, and people need to remember that when they're doing it. For instance, you always have to look worse than everyone else you're depicting. That is a big rule, I think. And you have to be harder on yourself than you are on everybody else. Mm -hmm. And then there's always the possibility of erecting subtle screens. You don't have to tell everything. You can always screen things off if that's really not part of the story, it's really not the thrust of the point of the story, and it would be hurtful to someone. On the other hand, if something that would be hurtful to someone is really key to the story, you think about it hard, and then you think about how you're putting it in there. And I think the, um, uh, I think the, I think it's just really important to remember it's a, it's a bizarre combination of, of thinking that people are going to read it and forgetting that they're going to read it. Many times when I'm doing a story about myself, I'm saying in my head, she. Now she needs to go over to the bed. Now she needs to go to the store. I'm not saying this is where I went to the store, where I did it, because ultimately I'm trying to turn it into something that is a story, and the story has to do with something way beyond everything in it. Uh, it it's the attempt always to, to stay on the theme and keep it universal, and I think that's what always will be your guide to doing it tastefully, having done a lot of it. Um, uh, I, uh, I try to, to, to keep that in mind when I'm doing it. Frederick? Um. Yeah, for me it's a bit different because the, the, the book was made very quickly. It took me less than three months to make it. Wow. So I, Jesus. I, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't make this again. I mean, I would be totally unable to, unable to do it again. I, I don't know how, how it really happened, in fact. Um, it was like a dream or like um, vomiting something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but the only, the only thing is that I didn't want to uh, involve, include people that I couldn't um, talk to or yeah, discuss with. So, for instance, uh, the, 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 the previous, the husband, the, the guy that was here before me, <laughs> I'm not talking about him. Uh, he's the father of the son in the, in the, in the book. I don't know him, so the only, th the only things I knew about him was uh, filtered through my wife, you know, which is really not a good idea because uh, obviously it's just the, a single angry point of view. So, and the same thing for my parents and my girlf girlfriend's parents, etc. So I, that drove some storyline at one point. For instance, uh, of course we had, we had to announce it you know, yeah, I'm in love with someone. We might live together for a while, and she's HIV positive. 
and this part you have to, you know, organize a meal with the parents, etc. And I didn't uh, write about it in the book. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just talking about the, the discussion we had with my girlfriend before going to the meal, mm -hmm. <laughs> and she, while she's cutting my hair, you know, mm -hmm. and suddenly I'm, I'm so unco uncomfortable like this, I fall down of the, sh of the chair because I'm a little bit frightened by, by what's going to happen. Um, it's that, that kind of tricks. Otherwise, it's like it was just um, going out of myself, you know, without control. You know, it was r weird. I was young, very young. Right. Yeah, you were 25, right? Yeah. When you yeah. started it. So yeah. um, I, I want to, you know, I just kind of to, to show some of the other stuff that you do because, um, like I said, your other stuff is like very surreal. Mm. Uh, dreamlike sometimes, you need some intrigue, uh, very imaginative. I mean, like you, I said, the complete opposite. This is, uh, um, this is from, uh, this I'm is sorry. From so Rupil, so. Yeah, I'm sorry, those are horrible scans. So no, I, it's I, my I, fault. I didn't have time to send I, you I, I know, I know. It's all, it's all, but uh, yeah, Sandcastle, that's kind of like a murder mystery. Yeah, in a way, or more like a Twilight Zone episode. Yeah, way, yeah. You know. Your stuff is, and <coughs> Pachyderm is a, another Twilight. I guess Twilight Zone is a lot. I think I, I didn't put a page from there. I'm sorry. But, um, and Ama is like the straight ahead, like space fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, again, but I mean, do you, I mean, do you put your own experiences in these completely made up things also? I mean, do you draw on your own life or? But firstly, uh, uh, blue pills change everything because suddenly I realized that I, I could improvise. I mean, mm. I could um, trust myself and fall on my feet again at the end. Uh, I was able to do that. M just maybe it's um, a little bit uh, naive or, I don't know, s self confident. I don't know how it works, but it works. So uh, <laughs> from that point, I always at least partly improvised the books. Uh, I I s uh, it's rare that I write something before. I write parts, uh, visions, dialogues, parts of dialogues. S um, sometimes I make a, a very light uh, plan of the of the book, but I don't write a scenario before, except when I when I'm working with someone else. Sun Castle was written for me by someone else, so this is really different. It's like mm. holidays. <laughs> <laughs> it's pure technical work, right. but yeah, this is the main. The main change is this one uh, with blue pills, and then I realized that it's also very effective to be con uh, emotionally con connected with the the characters. So I try to put, you know, it's like a, it's the famous Flaubert of things, uh, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. It's always like this in a way. You're always doing autobiography, right. even if you try to wrap it up. You know. Yeah. <laughs> No, um, you know, Durf, I mean, obviously you had, uh, you know, with Dahmer, you had a very dramatic story to tell. Um, were there, you know, but you, you had, you knew that this, I, you and I have talked about this before, and you have, and you've said this in interviews before, you know, that this is, you knew that this was your story, that this was going to be the thing they would say. This is the guy that knew Dahmer. Right. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, the Do that Dahmer guy is yeah. how I'm yeah, often the Dahmer referred guy. to. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. but but I mean, and the book's been so popular and you know well received. Um, so, like with the trashed book, you know, was there pressure on to find more mass murderers from your past? Oh <laughs> yeah. Well, the most freaking question was, you know, you're going to tell the rest of the story, and it's like, nah, you know. The heads in the refrigerator and all that stuff. That story's been told about a million times. That's all anyone's ever told. What attracted me to my friend Dahmer, oh, Jesus, get that off the screen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's uh, for, that's what some of the first yeah, stuff. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going, yeah, there we go. Um, <clears throat> what attracted me to my friend Dahmer was that it was a story I, I wasn't hearing. And, F, you know, I until you're, and God forbid that you are, until you're at the center of that media hurricane, you know, of a viral story, like a Kim Davis thing, or, you know, pick your, or the Dylan Roof thing. I mean, Dahmer was like that, magnified considerably. And I was right in the middle of it. And, you know, you had reporters beating on your door and all this stuff, and, you know, cameras peeking in your windows and things. And it's not a comfortable place to be, even though I was working in media at the time. I was working for newspapers. Um, 
But I just didn't hear the story being told. I heard, you know, it was all about the crimes, and they just brush across this, this first part, and I thought, man, that's a great story. And so I knew right from the beginning that I was going to tell it. It was just a question of how and when. And so it took a long time to 20 years, not three months, <laughs> <laughs> 20 years to put it together. Yeah, yeah and, look, uh, we have three months, eight years, yeah. 20 years, so, you um, know, varies. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Jennifer, with your with your story also, I mean, like you were looking in the rearview mirror of what had happened with your cancer, right? So you were telling just, you know, you were looking back on it. And I mean, there have been a lot of, I don't want to say a lot, but I mean, there have been other cancer memoirs and comics. I mean, Harvey Pekar and Joyce Brabner did our, our cancer year. And, um, I'm a you know, survivor too. Did you know that? Oh. What did you have? Lymphoma. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, there have been other breast cancer <laughs> yeah, memoirs. Yeah. Um, cancer Vixen was really great and was an inspiration for me. Um, that was, uh, and she and I were the same age, diagnosed the same month with wow. the same cancer. Wow. She had a lumpectomy, but she did a very different book because it was, you know, sort of New York glamorous world that she lived in, and she didn't have kids, and she was engaged to be married, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, it's not, you know, people are always like, wow, a graphic novel about breast cancer. Like, that's really innovative. And I'm like, no, actually, it's not. But <laughs> the difference for me was that I chose to tell not a cancer story, but uh, my whole story. Right, that's, yeah. Being a thorough person who's OCD as well as ADD. So I, I kind of, um, I said, well, I got to start at the beginning. So I started when I had no tits, and I ended when I had no tits. I mean, it's no tits to no tits, basically. But the, the, uh, the, the, what I wanted was to give the reader a sense, you know, as I thought about it, I thought, I, I don't want to have to depict myself in a doctor's room having, a doctor's office having them say, you have breast cancer, and then have to backtrack to, oh, and this was such a bummer because dot, dot, dot. I wanted the reader to have the same feeling I did when it hit me of, oh, check that out. Her mom had breast cancer. Her mother-in-law had cancer. She's nursed two babies. She was flat-chested when she was young. How ironic is all of this? And I wanted all of that. And actually, a lot of it was very funny, you know? I mean, it wouldn't be so funny if I had died, but it, it's funny because I lived. <laughs> and, and I hate to say that, but I mean, you know, and a lot of this, like, you know, there were moments like the guy when they were uh, they were looking for my sentinel nodes to do a sentinel node biopsy and they put they inject you with um, dye and then they read how it goes into the to find the um, your lymph nodes to pull them out and see if the cancer's moved which it hadn't thank you thank you thank you so they 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 um, so they're injecting my boob and they pull the needle out and there's a little blood and this person's carefully putting a band-aid over it you know <laughs> they're going to remove that breast an hour from now <laughs> and I'm like that, it just I, and, and by then I had nothing to eat for a very long time and I'd almost, you know, ripped a guy's hamburger out of his hand in the, <laughs> in the elevator. I was so hungry. And, uh, and I just thought, oh, this is so goddamn funny. You know, it's <laughs> so goddamn funny even though it's so goddamn awful. So I, you know, and I just have a problem. I just see things so many different ways at the same time. And when I was writing it was terrible because it was, I couldn't figure out which words to use. Anyway. Comics help discipline me, um, but it, it's yeah, anyway. That's uh, right. Well, it's a it's a it's a long book. I mean, it it's is not. not in there. It is it is there. It is. I mean, dense. I mean, you put so much in there, and because of all this, and you know, it it does reflect that. Um, I'd like to ask you all now, Jen. Your your, your book just came out, so but you've been talking about it for quite a while, and you've gotten into this community. So so I aware being aware of that, I would I would like to ask all of you how these books changed your lives, how these books coming out changed your lives. So, Frederick? Um, for me, it's quite easy. It allowed me to make a living out of it. <laughs> and also, it, it started the Atrabil, which is the publishing house, the Atrabil story. I mean, still today, I think we're living on this book. It, it, it was 15 years before. I was going to uh, say it's not. It's it was very successful when it came out, right? Yeah, it sold it's and it continues not. To it's not a yeah. best-selling right, worldwide, but, but I mean uh, enough to mm -hmm. for f to launch my career right. and also to yeah to how to help Atrabil. But know? how does it affect you and your family? Because I mean now you have um, you have a child. Yeah. You have you know your your wife has her son and you Honestly, two. Honestly, it yeah. didn't. Uh, 
it would be easier if I could compare with, a, with and without the book, of course. But um, we're living in a high cultured, arty, um, how would you say, it? with people around us, you know, like this, and even our parents. So it didn't change anything. And now the, the, the kid is 18 years old, but um, he's studying uh, modern dance in, a, in an art school. So he's surrounded by <laughs> blue-haired girls and <laughs> tattooed gay men. So you see, <laughs> nobody cares. Uh, but maybe it's just pure luck, I don't know. But. Or maybe it's Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer? Oh, um, well, I was, I was talking the other day about how um, this book changed my life, you know, like three times. First, there was deciding to do it, discovering comics, and finding my voice. It was almost as if my, you know, boobs had been taken and my voice came through. Because I just was never able to, to, to I, I knew I wanted to make something, but it, my actual voice just could never come through until I found comics. The course of doing the book changed me again because I had never been disciplined enough to do something this long for this many years and really stick um, stick with it. And I mean, the last even the last 20 pages were probably the most strength I ever had to have because it, uh, just continuing to believe in myself, to believe in the project, I didn't have anybody looking at it. I didn't have anybody encouraging me after Top Shelf bought it. They just left me alone. <laughs> and even after I handed it in, they were in negotiations with IDW. They were bought by IDW right after I handed it in. So I never heard from them for a year. For a year, I thought they thought the book sucked and they weren't <laughs> letting me know. So I waited and waited, and I kept thinking at odd moments, you know, oh, but that was a good scene. <laughs> I know that was good, and I, but I wasn't hearing anything. So when, and then when it came out, I just had this, it was a very quiet little celebration in my head, because I just thought, oh, now you're the person who made that book, you know? You did it. it, it came out of you. And it's really been unbelievable to have people get all of it the way I intended them to get it. And you know, so now I'm walking around like uh, my identity has just been sort of earth moved like three times and I'm trying to get around having an identity of somebody who did, who did this because I'm, I'm proud of it and it's like an achievement. Anyway, yeah. You should be proud. My turn? Yeah. Um, gosh, how did it change my life? It, it actually uh, was part of uh, my recovery from cancer, believe it or not. Um, that was actually both my first two books were part of that. And the first bout with cancer with punk rock and trailer parks, and then my friend Dahmer um, with the second bout. And, uh, you know, the process of working when you're recovering is, uh, is a big part of recovery. I mean, you know, I love making comics, I love drawing. So, I mean, that just getting back into a routine and doing that. And then when it came out, you know, and it was such a hit, I mean, it just uh, it rebooted my career. I was in this dying genre, this stupid comic strips. And, uh, you know, it just like vaulted me into uh, the whole new career. It was, it changed my life completely. And it's, it's been fabulous. I mean, comics did it. It is. <laughs> you want to hear my funny recovery uh, surgery, pre surgery please, thing? Please, yes, I do. When I was going in for. Uh, because they had all this radiation scarring after, so they had to like do all this arterial reconstruction. So they had to fish arteries out of my arm and stuff. So that's what that scar is. Mm. But my wife, as I'm, before I'm going in, she took my drawing arm and she wrote in Sharpie, no, 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 <laughs> all the way up my arm. <laughs> so they wouldn't screw with my drawing arm. And so yeah. comics, even as you're heading into the operating yeah. room. Well, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> awesome. look ahead. Um, you know, we, we will open it up to questions. So we have a mic, so if you have a question, if you want to go over there um, to, to buy the mic. Um, what, uh, yeah, there's there's two, so. Um, but uh, Durfo, uh, just, you know, going back to the trash thing, I think you, you told me that you are going to do this trash book, and I think I got excited about it also, <laughs> you know, because I was like, you know, trash men, trash, garbage. This it is, was at Angolim, right? Yeah, it was. It was as we were there together. And um, I, but it, you know what? Like, like you were a trash, you were a garbage man. Right. But this is, 
you know, fictionalized, perhaps well, because the hijinks that you guys go through are like, you know, shocking a little bit. Well, all the stuff that happens on the truck is based on that's real experience. All the characters are fiction, but the, the experiences are all real. Yeah, I know, man. It's, you know, pulling, you know, squat, you know, roadkill off of the deer off the road. You have to scrape it off with a shovel. The maggots. And the, yeah, the maggots. maggots, maggots all that one. stuff. Yeah, it's, it's a real, gr but it's also a very serious look at this garbage obsession of ours that we, you know, throw out this incredible amount of crap. I mean, it's just a staggering amount of crap, and I try to try to show you exactly how much we throw out and we're filling our world with garbage so you may look at the back of the truck and say man that's really gross i don't ever want to live that but you know it's coming your way as we speak <laughs> um so i thought it was a, it was just a fun book i mean i knew the characters i've been working with them a while i'd done web comics with them before and i'd done a actually done a memoir uh, early on too on my own experience so i had like worked on it a while and i just wanted to come back to something comfortable after my friend Dahmer, because <clears throat> You know, how do you follow up a big book? Yeah. Do you think, how old were you when you were actually a trash man? I was uh, 20 and 21. Okay. And, and knowing the other people who did it with you, you were, you retired. To retired. Become, to become a cartoonist. <laughs> what do you think was the mindset necessary for people to seek a long-term career in garbage oh, collection? Yeah, I don't know, man. There's some who do. I mean, mm. I went f to research this book. You know, I, I went and, and uh, you know, talked to a bunch of garbage crews and guys who'd been doing it for 20, 25 years. And uh, some of the older guys had moved into, you know, management roles, management garbage, because as one of them told me, you know, man, garbage is a young man's game. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is. It's actually the sixth most dangerous profession in, in the country. Cops and firefighters aren't even close as far as fatality rates. What? Yeah, I'm serious. Six most dangerous profession. Why? What, how, how do you die? You get, well, you read the book. Uh, <laughs> you yeah. get scraped off. Oof. You get run over. You get, I mean, all sorts of eaten things. Eaten by maggots, yeah. Yeah, so. eaten by maggots. So. Anyway. All right, you know what? Uh, I have a question up here. It's too good. It's too good for my English. Um, <laughs> it is a good question. When I'm looking back at blue pills, uh, I look like a very hard-lighted young man. Yeah, and today I'm a depressed old man. <laughs> uh, so there, there is something true. Um, but. My, my, my style of drawing is, is evolving in the same time as myself, so... Um, but, you know, those are interesting but very dangerous questions to ask t to myself, because it's like, um, <coughs> in, it's like in the restaurant, you don't, you don't want to know what's happening in the kitchen, and even myself, <laughs> I don't want to know uh, what's going on and how it works. I mean, as long as it works and gives me pleasure, and allows me to live out of it. So um, I prefer to think about techniques, stories, etc. But I keep this f uh, for my old days. It's a very nice, interesting question. You know? <laughs> Sorry about this. I do pretty simple drawings, so there aren't a lot of lines to choose from. So whether you have a carrot nose or a simple nose or what your hair looks like, that's all there is in my work to, to, to make me me. So I have a gigantic nose, so that's, I picked the, the huge nose, and, um, and uh, I've had people come up at conventions and go, I know who you are from your drawings. You're Jennifer Hayden, and I'm always yeah. like, you know what, screw Yeah, you know. <laughs> Better than that, you know, but, um, you know, but that is how I see myself. I see myself as a gangly. But the thing is, I've been doing this for 10 years, and Alison Bechdel, after a while, added, 
the little lines on the sides of her mouth. She was very truthful about her aging. And I don't know what to do, because if I add more lines, I'm just going to look 100. So I'm, mm. I'm, I'm, this is a hot issue I'm facing. I find the uglier I draw myself, the more I'm recognized by that particular <laughs> drawing. And I'll just leave it there and try not to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any more questions out there? Yeah. You should go to the mic, but I'll, have, I'll repeat you it. You must I'll, go to the I'll mic. No, I'll repeat the, the question. I'll repeat it. <laughs> yeah. The question is, how did how did you talk to people who are going to be in their store in your story, real people, and how did they react? So I think I've answered this before. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, well, I didn't give it a lot of thought. I probably should have, um, but I pretty much just did what I had to do, and I tried to do it, as I say, tastefully, and I. You know, one old boyfriend contacted me on Facebook, and I had drawn him in the book, and I thought, this is okay, because he's never going to see this. <laughs> <laughs> and then he contacted me, and I said, so, dude, I did possibly draw you in something that might get into print. Do you mind? And he, he just said, do what you got to do, you know, which is pretty much my husband's approach. He's a very private guy. He cannot understand why I'm doing this, although he would never not support me because we've been, you know, co-artists forever. He's a musician, and anyway, um, but uh, but at one point he said, "You never asked," you know, and I, because I, I said, "How dare you have a problem with this? I only depict you in a, in a good light. Sometimes, yes, you're naked and doing things to me, but you know, it's not that." Like, it's, it's not Private. It's everyone does that. I, that's my feeling. I feel like everyone's done this. There's nothing in here that's a big secret. My dad slept around, you know. So what? Um, but at, the 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 galleys. Um, we did galleys for BEA, and um, I gave my mother one, and she can't read comics. She's 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 so fun. She's she's like looking at them, going, I don't I don't understand what you know how I don't, I can't read this. It's too small. Like she's completely struggling with this. <laughs> But she's so proud of me, so she keeps it on the coffee table, and so she, she um, the whole family has had access to it because it's been on the coffee table, and as they come troop through visiting her, and you know, the different reactions, it's been quite, uh, uh, the, the whole summer has been like this roller coaster of reactions. I guess I probably should have checked with people before I did this, but I just had a feeling I wouldn't do it if I, if I did. What about your kids? Oh. <laughs> they hate me. No, it's not that bad. They are well. They're getting older now, so that's so that's better. Thank my God. Son, my son has ignored my career a hundred percent. Only now, he wants my contacts in comics because he's starting to write about comics. So is that ironic or what? He writes about not indie comics, but um, um, superhero comics. So um, my daughter was the one who was very emotional about me doing this story because she was very attached to me and she'd been very upset by the breast cancer thing. And knowing that I was working on the book, sometimes she would tell me, I can't believe we have to keep reliving this through you. And I was like, you, it's just on my desk. You don't have to look at it. She's like, well, you're always talking about it. And I was like, I have to do this. So she's now in college. And I'm not kidding. Like a week ago, she said, I'm so glad you did this book. I never, you would never have been as solid a mother as you have, have been if you hadn't done it. And, um, and uh, now I feel encouraged to try things I never thought that I could, could I, I don't think that I can get. Like, she's trying to get an Oxford uh, writing program. And, and I was very gratified. I thought, okay, that, I didn't make a mistake doing mm -hmm. this. A happy ending. <laughs> uh, I did ask, I did ask everyone in the, in the book that I used. Um, did Dahmer? Yeah, Dahmer. Yeah. Um, except the people who are dead, of course, um, because you know it. It there there are people that don't willingly want to be 
caught up in this story and they have been caught up in the past and it was painful for them. So uh, some of the names are changed and some of the appearances are changed. Some of the people didn't mind, they didn't, they didn't care. So, but I asked everyone and uh, I just thought that was the way to go. Any other, any other questions here? Yeah. Just as a follow up to the last question in the last discussion you had, have you ever drawn characters that were pulled from your, like you, you created characters for your stories, but they ended up being so like real people that you then had to go back and talk to them after the fact? Or had them approach you because of that? Sorry, I didn't get the question. It sounded like we'd, we'd actually drawn people who existed in the world, but we had never met them. Well, you had met them. They were, they were part of your life at some point, but you didn't realize that when you created the characters. Oh, uh, like being fiction, so like you mean? Uh, yeah. Basing fictional characters on real people? Yeah. Plagiarizing your memory. Yeah. Um, wow, I don't know. I'll find out with a garbage truck story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it hasn't happened yet, but uh, people think they see themselves in my friend Dahmer, like people I went to high school with. And, uh, you know, I say, no, sorry. <laughs> but uh, um, luckily, I, I, I draw strange enough that, you know, you can't really tell. I mean, I'm not really drawing realistically. And a lot of time passed, too, so, you know, these people are now old. Um, it hasn't happened yet. We'll see. <laughs> Do you, um, did you all have um, reference material that you used? Oh, yeah. You know? Did you save it at the time? I mean, how did you approach reference for this, for your projects? You're talking about memoir here? Yeah, the, yeah. yeah. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing, no. I had, I had an entire file cabinet yeah. full of <laughs> reference, yeah. yeah. I mean, I gathered as much photo reference as I could, because it's a period piece, first of all. Right. And it was just kind of fun for me, you know. I mean, I even got, there's a scene set in, in, a, in a mall. It's kind of a spooky scene. And uh, I went and got a floor plan of this damn mall from, like, 1975. <laughs> and so I was so obsessive, then I went to the newspaper archives and got, like, old ads that showed the stores. And so I put the right sign, yeah, that's it. I put the right sign in the right place for when the scenes took place. It was crazy. But it was a way for me to detach from, you know, this very serious, sinister, uh, disturbing story, which had caused me a lot of sleepless nights by just obsessively zeroing in on this detail. And did it only for my own amusement, just because, you know, this was the mall I used to hang out in, and it was, it was fun to do that. Um, and people seem to really respond to that, but that's just a happy accident. That's all that was. I had to make sure I didn't do that. I knew that it would take me forever <laughs> if I added that to the list of hurdles that I had to jump over. So I told myself, always just make it, make the, even the pictures of my childhood home aren't accurate. They're, it, it's just make it reminiscent, reminiscent, reminiscent <laughs> enough. And, and often if I, if I had drawn my home, it, I wouldn't have had enough things to hand. You know, I kept, in a scene, you know, I always felt like, like I was writing a play and the, the pieces of what I needed in the scene needed to be there and accessible and in, in the shot, you know. So, uh, that, so my actual living room wouldn't work, so I would draw an invented living room. And then I had to keep them consistent and that was a little irritating. Yeah. I'd have to go back and see what I did make. But I, I also draw no pencils, no script, minimal outline. Outline is like one or two sentences per chapter. and. Just write, each day is a surprise. I just want every panel, every day to be a brand new thing I didn't know I was gonna draw. Otherwise I'm bored. Ugh, yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, like a, I'm like a Trappist monk bent <laughs> over a parchment. <laughs> drawing one letter for a month. <laughs> uh, well, but you, the, the, the woman's question earlier then, it was like, Jennifer, you were drawing yourself emotionally. You're just drawing yourself how you felt, really, yeah, in, a, in, in, in a lot of ways, yeah. and uh, which, which is interesting. So, any, anybody else out there? Yeah. I know I already asked a question, but I do have another. Do, do you feel that by drawing yourself and then also writing at the same time what's going on is more emotionally draining than if you just wrote what was going on or just kept um, sketch notes in your book? Do you think going back to this every day? Because it seems like everyone, all three of you, have had an emotional experience going into that. Do you think the, that the drawing and the writing together has what led it to that? 
Well, that's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> We're I comics mean, creators. That. This he is how we this is how we tell stories. That combination is, is sort of our favorite flavor, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it to me it's just more truthful than if I only used words. I've never told stories any other way. Same thing I for have, me. And it wasn't as good. <laughs> why do you <laughs> Why do you all think that um, I mean, you know, Alison Bechtel, you know, obviously Fun Home is a memoir and you know, she was a diarist. I mean, she kept, you know, she I I, I would, you know, I don't want to say very detailed, but she kept so many notes and everything and obviously that really helped her when she did did her memoir, but um, you know, Chrome, you were talking about the underground cartoonists also have this, you know, self non-fiction comics. I mean, it's a very powerful, that comics seem to be very well suited to telling these kind of stories. Why do, why do you all think that is? I, it's, just, it's just the way I work. I mean, I've been always doing this. Um, my mother has um, autobiographic stories when I was seven years old doing in comics. So, I should try something else, but I'm, I'm afraid I'm not able to. <laughs> I really think there is something about comics. I think they're so accessible, and I think that um, it helps erase the distance between the, the writer and the viewer in a way that, I feel like in a way that writing can't. You always have to take up a posture, it seems to me, when you're writing, and when I'm drawing and writing, it just seems like it's, it's, it's right there up, up against, uh, it's right there in the viewer's hands. It can be so immediate. And autobiography is best, I think, and memoir when it's immediate. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is very much like, like you know, it's, it is using both sides of your brain to kind of connect these, both these feelings and these, these you know, accurate, accurate uh, depictions of things that happened. So what would you, uh, any any more questions out there for for our audience? Would you, uh, if somebody, and I'm sure you've all had this happen, that somebody comes up to your table and says they want to do their own memoir comic or nonfiction comic. So, uh, what advice do you give? Uh, well, I, I warn them that it's not as easy as it seems on the surface. I mean, it seems like everybody wants thinks, well, I'll just write about myself. That's easy. It's, I think it's actually the hardest thing to do and it's really hard to do well. Um, there's a lot of bad memoir out there. There's a lot of great memoir, but um, you know, you have, to, you have to have it in you. Um, I would say read some really good memoir and, and, and see if you can you know, muster up that kind of uh, brutal honesty to, to uh, replicate it. I always encourage people because I think it's wonderful for people to tell their stories and they won't stick with it if they don't have it in them. So they'll, they'll poop out if they, if they don't really want to do it. But it's, it's so therapeutic, even if they just do it and put it in a drawer and don't pursue it or don't finish it. It can be you know, a great help, um, a very healing thing. Um, Frederick, you, were, you and I were chatting yesterday, and you mentioned that in France there are a lot of memoir, or auto, like diary comics, really, right? It's a bit over now. Oh, I mean, it is? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was a huge trend for a while, right? Yeah. And... Um, and especially also the, the travel story, you know, when you go to Peru and <laughs> say, oh my goodness, I went to Peru as if, as if I was the only one to go to Peru. <laughs> 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 and I took a bus, you know, and there were chicken in a bus and <laughs> no interest. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, like I said, you're, you're, you know, your work has become completely like, I mean, I, I recommend it. I mean, I recommend all three of these, these creators highly like all their work, um, but if you want some really mind-bending science fiction and fantasy, I totally recommend Frederick's, Frederick's work down there. Um, so yeah, what is, uh, I, I know you guys hate this and I'm gonna do it anyway, so what will be next for you? What is, what is the next adventure, the next frontier, so? I um, just finished this goddamn book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're done, you're on tour now, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just finishing a, very weird, gay-friendly Western. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And then, uh, I don't know, the next one. Uh, I, I, I'm working on the next two or three books in my head now, but I, it's too early to tell. Right, 
Right. Work till you die. Yeah. <laughs> I have, exactly. Sitting, uh, <laughs> I have two collections that I'd like to bring out. I don't know if, that'll, if I'll find a publisher for them. I have this diary comic and I have this other scrapbook thing, uh, short form comic I'd like to collect. And then I want to try um, a combination of autobiography and fiction. Ooh. Ooh. So I have a shoebox with ideas in it, and I don't know what will happen. Wow. Well, mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, more to come, as we like to say. Well, please go and uh, check out. Uh, you're all signing. Uh, are you signing later today? All three of these all fine day. creators all day. Mm-hmm. Go get up their new books. Find out about trash. Find out about tits. Find out about <laughs> <laughs> adventure. <laughs> Uh, and thank you all for coming, and thank you, Durf, Jennifer Hayden, Frederick Peters. <laughs>